Well, welcome everyone to this final session of the Judith Herb College of Education Spring Symposium entitled Stories Matter. And we all have stories to tell and everyone's story is worth telling. Before we hear from our distinguished panelists this afternoon, um, we'd like to hear from the president of the University of Toledo uh, as he introduces our symposium today. I am Dr. Gregory Postel, president of the University of Toledo. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Judith Erb College of Education's 2021 Spring Symposium, Stories Matter. Our core values of the University of Toledo include excellence, student-centeredness, research and scholarship, professionalism and leadership, and diversity. This symposium celebrates these values through a joyful and scholarly examination of children's and young adults' literature. Over the last several months, the University of Toledo and the Judith Erb College of Education have initiated a number of efforts to engage in conversations about social justice inclusion and diversity. We need these conversations, perhaps now more than ever. Yet we know these conversations are not always easy ones to have. One place we can look for ways to open up those conversations is children's and young adult literature. The images and words in children's and young adult literature help us tell our stories, to communicate who we are, and to better understand others. The illustrations and language also underscore the idea that we can take control of how we want to represent ourselves. Stories matter. As Rudine Sims Bishop, a scholar of children's literature, has famously written, books are sometimes windows, offering views of the world that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors, and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become part of whatever world has been created and recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us, and in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. In this symposium, you will have a chance to look through windows, go through sliding glass doors, and get a glimpse of yourselves in mirrors. Featured are celebrated authors and illustrators, Cosby Cabrera and Inosanto Nagara, who share stories about themselves and others that can prompt us to take a look at ourselves and others from new vantage points. And Benjamin Sapp, the director for the Maza Museum at the University of Finley, shows us how the illustrations in children's literature have become more inclusive over time. Finally, the symposium concludes with a panel discussion about the power and potential of children's and young adult literature to help us build better understandings and have difficult conversations. This session includes our earlier presenters, as well as Michael Deitch, Director of Education for the Toledo Museum of Art, and Heidi Apple, Dean of the Honors College. Part of the mission of the University of Toledo is to enable our graduates to become a part of a diverse community of leaders committed to improving the human condition in the region and the world. Through today's symposium, and in activities to follow, we strive to fulfill our mission as we examine the ways in which the language and illustrations of children's and young adult literature can launch us into critical conversations about social justice, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoy the symposium, and go Rockets. Thanks, Josh. So, um, before we actually get started, I would invite um, everyone who is not speaking to please mute 
um, your microphones. We're getting a little bit of feedback here, so I'm hoping we can do that. Um, and anyone who has questions, please enter them into the chat and we will make sure to relay those to um, all of the panelists so that they have an opportunity to to address the things that you're wondering about um, or comments that you'd like to make. So uh, I appreciate it. Rather than introducing each of the panelists and certainly forgetting to say something that I would intend to say, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, but I've added a little bit of a twist to their introductions. And in order to explain that to you, I want to read this quote to you um, that comes from Adam Gopnik, who is the editor for the New Yorker magazine. Adam said, there's a certain class of books that I think of as the library of the early mind. That is, books that imprint themselves so deeply on our consciousness when we are young that they stay with us for the rest of our lives. They stay with us as a set of images, a set of ideals of behavior, or even, or even perhaps as goals that we hope to arrive at someday. As our presenters, our panelists this afternoon introduce themselves, I've asked each of them to um, tell us if there are particular books, maybe one, maybe more, um, from their early memories that is that kind of, has had that kind of an influence on them, that kind of has stayed with them. So, um, I'm going to actually mute myself and um, invite anyone who'd like to of our panelists to uh, begin by introducing yourself and your book. Well, I'd be happy to start. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm. Yeah, Heidi Apple, I'm Dean of the Honors College, and we, we have a really um, almost beloved relationship with the College of Education, <laughs> I think, because of the importance we feel for education in general, and also because of their emphasis on social justice and one of the first pathways that, that we have to influence the world, really. And so, um, so I'm very pleased to be part of the panel and, and thrilled to be in such great company. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm old, so you may not recognize the book I'm about to describe, but it, it was a, a book by Jane Werner Watson uh, called The Tall Book of Make Believe. And it was tall, so it, was, it caught your attention because it's, it's tall and narrow. And it was filled with whimsical illustrations by Garth Williams. And a little bit more than whimsical, it is they were all a little off kilter. They all created some sort of cognitive dissonance when you looked at them. Something was either a little scary or looked a little different. And as a, as a little kid, I was just fascinated by that. So that's my influential book. Thank you, Heidi. Well, I'm going to go next. Um, I'm not one of the official panelists, but my name is Susanna Hapgood, and I'm on the faculty at the College of Education, and uh, my area is uh, early literacy, um, but particularly also where uh, investigations of science, engineering, and early literacy all come together. And perhaps that's why, now I actually have a pile of books on my desk in front of me because I was having difficulty making a choice. But uh, when I really think about a book that's had a profound influence on me all my life, um, it's, it's um, Alice in Wonderland. And um, I happened to have a set of records. If we, we some of us will remember what LPs are like. Um, I had a whole box set of uh, Cyril Richards 
reading aloud Alice in Wonderland. And his voice has become part of just my existence in, in, in the world. Um, I memorized Jabberwocky, uh, the poem, because of his, his recordings, but I would listen to them over and over again. Must have been about eight hours of, of recordings. Um, eventually, my parents said I memorized much of it. And when we would be driving, I grew up in Maine, when we'd be driving from Boston back to, to Maine, um, for some event or other, I was dragged around to another, yet another museum. Um, I would recite in the back seat, Alice in Wonderland to myself. Uh, and uh, just, just, you know, that phrase that's in the beginning of chapter two, curiouser and curiouser, cried Alice. Um, just is something, it's a refrain in my existence. Thank you, Susanna. Well, my name is Benjamin Sam. Go ahead. Oh, see, this is this is the challenge of virtual uh, panel discussions, isn't it? <laughs> yes, please, Mike. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, so I'm Mike Deach. I'm with the uh, Toledo Museum of Art. Um, you know, I, and I've been thinking about this question since you uh, sort of prepped us for this, Jenny. Um, I'm having a difficult time thinking back to my own childhood when I'm a parent of two young children. Um, and I think, you know, children's books, uh, picture books in particular, are sort of ever present for me right now. <clears throat> so if I think back to my own childhood, it's not necessarily. Uh, books, but Mad Magazine as a big influencer in my life. I think the pop culture references, the humor, the satire in that was really fun for me and a fun way to engage. But, you know, as as a parent and um, a parent of uh, a biracial son who was born in 2011, one of the things that became very apparent to me was how, at least at the time he was born, how few books have children of color as the main protagonist if they weren't talking about adoption in a far, faraway land or weren't talking about multiculturalism. Um, and so I'm more than honored and humbled to be on this panel with uh, our, our two authors and illustrators here uh, for really helping change that, that narrative because um, even in the last 10 years since my son was born, what a great uh, influx of books and literature and information is now more readily available than it was 10 years ago as I'm searching frantically at the local Barnes and Noble to find books uh, that, that I wanna be proud of showing to my son and reading to my son, so. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's sort of where I am, and I would say with with that end, Faith Ringgold's Tar Beach uh, was one of the first books that I remember reading to my son that really just stood out to me as beautiful. And of course, Miss Ringgold is also an artist herself and is exhibited in museums, and so there was great great connection for me there. Thanks, Mike. My name is Ben Sapp, director of the Mazza Museum. Um, I get the question asked a lot of of me is out of the artworks that you have at the museum, what is which is your favorite? And I, I have as much difficulty answering that as I did with this question about the books. Um, for me, it's about the persons uh, creating those works, both um, the the illustration as well as the words that come together and and out of 32 pages make something very very special the what we say is the 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 real work of art um and it's those people that are special uh each one in their own individual uh way uh that um it makes this question uh as well as the other one uh so very difficult to answer Thanks, Ben. You deftly avoided answering the question. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm in right about now. Uh, yeah, my name is Cosby A. Cabrera. Um, and the question is actually very specific. It's a question of the very earliest sort of um, childhood um, memory, you know, and so this act of holding it in one's hand as a child, perhaps my and being able to read the words, um, you know, definitely see pictures. And there are a few books that come to mind. Um, and one was, uh, it's called Our Baby. And I just remember being a little affrighted of that story, not quite understand what was going on in it or what it really attempting to say. Um, that, that was like a very, very sort of like first early impression. Um, but I also grew up with the, the Beatrice Potter series um and the um dick jane and i call it the jane Scott readers um yeah and in, in all of those cases um anyone that looked or resembled me or perhaps my family um, was um, very definitely absent in those very early uh, thanks cosby Am I up? Yeah. You're up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Mina Santanagara, and I'm uh, an author and illustrator of a number of children's books. A is for activist is the one that um, gets around the most, but um, I've written a number a number of other ones since then, all sort of social justice themed. And um, my latest one is called Oh, the Things We Are For. Um, that question, you know, my favorite book or a book that was most influential to me, just like as with others, is very difficult. Um, I read a lot of books <laughs> as a kid, books are very influential. It's like, what's the most? Well, that's like picking your favorite kid kind of thing. But, um, and I had a similar experience with audiobooks where I listened to a recording of The Hobbit um, that was that I listened to every night and got it memorized. And it was a uh, something like a 12 cassette um, thing that I would play different pieces of it. But um, I think in terms of ones that had sort of influence on me in a way that is more explicit than <laughs> than uh, Bilbo Baggins' uh, adventures. Um, I, what comes to mind is there was a book, I looked it up not too long ago, the author was Bernard Weber, and I did get a copy of it, and it, it doesn't necessarily hold up <laughs> the rest of the book, but the one that I do remember her, um, being very influential to me was there's one little story about this kid named Peter Perfect, and Peter Perfect was always perfect. He always did his homework on time. He so, said thank you and please and, you know, all these kind of things. And then the last page of the book, they have, they show Peter Perfect, and then they walk around him, and on the back, he's got a wind-up uh, thing. So he's a robot. So the whole story was, no, and the book is actually called Nobody is Perfect. And so, to me, the idea that nobody is perfect that is was a was one at an early age i think particularly growing up in indonesia where there was a lot of sort of emphasis on um on how to be very and i think that's true here too but it's in some ways more explicit in the schooling that i had in asia about sort of how to be more you know the perfect citizen um that i i feel it was important message to me that you know actually that it's okay to not be perfect. In fact, nobody is. Thanks, Eno. Um, I guess that leaves me. Um, I've been thinking about this question since I asked it. Um, and I'd have to say that um, there was a whole series of books that I remember so clearly from from my childhood, and they were the Raggedy Ann and Andy series of books. And what stood out to me most about those books was the fact that at night, when Marcella would go to sleep, all of her toys and animals would come to life. And they had this wonderful, existence they'd get into trouble sometimes but 
they were able to kind of get around their issues. And I was a person who loved stuffed animals. And so mine were always in an array around my room. And I loved, I would go to sleep every night thinking, I wonder what they're going to do tonight. Because I was convinced that my stuffed animals would do everything that Marcellus had done. Um, my imagination has stayed with me, I would say, um, as, as I think about the work that I do, trying to imagine what's possible um, in lots of different areas. Um, I think I forgot to tell you my name. I'm Jenny Denyer. Um, I am, like Susanna, a faculty member in the College of Education. I'm actually the chair of the Department of Teacher Education. Um, and I'm so thrilled to be able to um, be here with all of you this afternoon. One of the things um, that as we've been preparing for this symposium and in particular for this uh, conversation, I want to kind of underscore the notion of conversation. Um, we have some ideas and um, some things that we'd like all of us to just kind of think together a bit about. Um, first and foremost, we want to make sure that um, all of the people who are with us today have an opportunity to ask questions um, of our panelists. Um, and we have a few things that we thought we might just kind of get started with while people are starting to formulate those questions in their mind. Um, Susanna, I'm wondering if you can put up um, the presentation that you created. Thank you. And if you can, yeah, perfect. That's a great place to start right there. Um, this quote by Brian Pinckney, smaller stories help children understand the bigger stories. One story is, is in book, one story is in books. The bigger story is the world. I'm wondering what your reactions are to that quote. Do you agree? Do you disagree? What do you think about that? And please, anybody who wants, just jump right in. <laughs> the society, it, this is such a, this quote really resonates with me when I, when I was reading through <laughs> in the sound of books, because they they hit you at so many different layers. So there are small stories that are embedded in a larger story. And so, you know, I was imagining trying to read it to my kids or now grandkids as a, to, to a three-year-old, but then embedded in this are all these other layers and the playful use of language. So to me, that was a smaller story. And that's true if I think for both con the community and activist book, it was a small story that's embedded in this larger story uh, at, that I found very powerful. Yeah, I mean, you know, Brian Pickney, <laughs> Pickney is a uh, legend and, you know, he puts it very well and it's, you know, kind of following in the footsteps of many who've gone ahead of us. I think, you know, I mean, that is how I would think about it. I would think about is I, I use more of the term layers, but, you know, the mm -hmm. for my books, I try to, you know, to make sure that there's multiple layers in the storytelling. There's, you know, starting with the two-year-old layer, the image layer, looking for the cat layer, the uh, <laughs> the layer for the adults so that you don't get bored reading to your kid, um, so you're not falling asleep, so you can share your love of reading um, the bigger words layer, the, you know, all the way to, you know, telling the story of, you know, how do you overthrow the government um, layer and, you know, and at the core, the idea of agency, the idea that uh, you have something to give, some way to engage in the world, even if bad things happen, even if we are um, confronted with struggles and, and difficulties. So um, I think 
you know, I use a lot of words to say all that. And <laughs> um, the the simpler way to say it's that it's uh, it's uh, smaller stories and bigger stories. <laughs> <laughs> When I was first talking um, with our dean about um, who we would like to invite um, to the symposium, um, one of the first things Dean Whitty did was go out and purchase some books of both of our presenters. And he came back to me a couple of days later and he said, I must have misheard you. Because A is for activist is an alphabet book. He said, so, but there's some really important and complicated concepts in there. Am I, did I mishear you? What is it? And so we had this wonderful conversation about the very things that, that you know you're met, you're talking about here and, and that Heidi has identified as, um, I think I think that is the beauty of many picture books um, in that there are those layers and that um, you know I taught seventh and eighth grade for a number of years and never hesitated to use picture books with at that age level and others would say, oh, but those are those books are not for for seventh and eighth graders. Um, and so it took some convincing of my colleagues to help them kind of open up their minds and begin to see those layers, which it's not, I think is not always the case. And uh, for me, I think uh, this notion of the power of many stories from Many different voices is no different than the expansion we get um, when we travel, you know, um, when we're not traveling, say, as tourists, you know, we're on the, uh, the cruise ship with people that um, may come from there, eat the same foods, you know, and, and then we go from port to port and pick up a trinket or two. But actual real travel where we are engaged with the people we try to understand what they're saying and their perspective and their their point of view. And I think it it really sort of uh, broadens us in such a way that we're not just stuck in our little piece of cloth, our little uh, square of quilt, you know, in the larger human story, uh, which is of course the world. If I may comment on something again uh, 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 on this general theme of little stories within big stories, um, I, in reading your book, Casby, that my hair is a garden. There, it is so multi-sensory because you're commenting on fragrances and what you see and what you hear, and to me, those are another kind of little story within. <laughs> The big story or threads of the same story. Uh, and I was, you know, struck and there were times when you were describing the, um, the, when you were in the garden and describing the visual image of the garden. I, you know, I, I just sat back and I read it 2 or 3 times because it, it, it was such an evocative way to describe what a very intense visual experience is in the outdoors, at least for me, I'm a biology plant biologist. So I was particularly susceptible <laughs> to those <laughs> descriptions. But again, I think that's that's another way to think about little stories within big stories is when they are multi sensory like that. Right, and just the layers in that garden scene where um, Miss Tilly, uh, who is helping Mackenzie learn how to take care of her hair. Mackenzie has been teased now at school about about what her hair is like, and um, she's run to her favorite neighbor, Miss Tilly, and asked for for help, not just for comfort. She would have asked that of her mother, but for Help. She she knew that this um, 
person in her neighborhood was a trusted, uh, a trust, uh, a person she could trust. Um, and Miss Tilly tells her the story of saving the, the little red maple tree that got trampled by the workmen who had come to do some work. But, you know, that's such a nice little small story that's also kind of the story of Mackenzie right now learning how to being taken care of and uh, beginning to thrive um, and grow because of that care. Really lovely. Uh, thank you, Sister and Heidi. It, it may look on the surface because it's more that a child has a problem and she's looking for some solutions. Um, but any child can pluck out um, this idea of going to someone who may have a, a better understanding of science and asking for help and, and you know, and this notion of what does a garden mean and the fact so many of our creation stories and so many different cultures do start off in a garden, you know, where you know all the issues of our lives do kind of relate to our ability to find ways to cultivate, you know, to go something from very small and seemingly unusual at times to um you know, like getting to, to uh to work. Here's another um, quote that Susanna and I both really liked. The best children's stories are wisdom just dipped in art and words. And I think that it is a way for us to capture all the hard fought for lessons and put them in a form that is transportable. I love this notion of the hard, hard fought lessons that we can take with us, we can bring to other places, to other people. Others? Agreed. Yeah, I, I love this quote. Um, so I agree with you, Jenny. Um, I think it's a, an, a wonderful quote because oftentimes you think of books uh, as a thing we, uh, go to to access on um, information and and that things that we can apply, um, you know. But this notion of the hard fought lessons, um, it, it sort of tells us um, that there are these intangible assets that we can get from uh, the storytelling, you know, a thing, intangible things like courage, for example, and mm -hmm. to see examples of you know how that um, plays out. I agree. Well, I guess. We had, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, and and you know, when you were talking about your favorite book, and that it, you know, was that a heart fought for lesson in the Peter Perfect? <laughs> um. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. The. To me, I think I, mean, I was thinking about this quote because, um, you know, th this is the ideal, right? That it is wisdom, and not all stories and not all children, children's books are great, and not all tell the stories or have the wisdom that um, we would want <laughs> shared. So, you know. That's sort of uh, you know honestly uh, to be critical about how the concept, um, but I think the idea, to me, the the wisdom part is the important word there because it's what we try to do is to not just be didactic in these children's book, right? Where you know it's not about just presenting information for you to memorize and know. I mean, this is what distinguishes what we're trying to do, what some of us are trying to do them from, you know, doctrine, um, what the mainstream is actually doing in most of the other books out there. And so I, I would, you know, I think the idea that it's about, it's not about uh, 
facts or memorization or um, argument as much of it as it's about the concept of, you know, our, my kid's name is Arif, which in is Arabic uh, name in Indonesia has Arabic for wisdom. And the idea that, you know, what's important isn't just about sort of knowing this or knowing that it's about the idea that you know kind of like the the aa prayer <laughs> it's about how, you know knowing what you have control over and what you don't and having the wisdom to know the difference and the wisdom part is the thing that it, um that i think for me is the most important part of of the process And I, I think, too, that um, both of these quotes um, have, allow for an extension of conversation to make them mean even more um, and to uh, make the, the big stories uh, of the world um, maybe a bit gentler uh, as as we come in contact or or deal with those on a, on a daily basis through life. Um, I think there are times where we read the words and don't take in everything that both the words and the illustrations are really saying. And by having conversations or by hearing authors and illustrators like the two of you and so many others that are now available, um, it truly allows that text and those those books to to really say and mean even more than maybe what they did uh, 20 years ago, uh, and I thank all of you for being a part of that. Yeah, it's interesting you say gentler. Oh, oh sorry, Mike, if you want to jump in. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I was just going to add, you know, this, this also makes me think. How effective children's books can be and. Making the making children feel a part of the world. In, in a way that, so you know, I, I I've been thinking about this a lot lately, as I listen to the news or I watch the news and my kids overhear it, right? And it's presented in a way that either is like unfamiliar or scary uh, or opaque <laughs> to them, but yet the news itself, right? The reality is they're experiencing, it, right? And the way I'm listening to it, right? They don't. It doesn't make sense to them, and I think through wonderful books, you know, like our authors have here, it presents it in a way that it says, yeah, you know, your feelings are valid. They're justified. These are experiences that we're all having, and, and I'm going to represent it in a way that you can connect with. And, you know, because I, I think a lot about, too, how children's books can be so beneficial in helping kids deal with their emotions and their feelings when they don't know how to do it, right? And and there are beautiful ways, illustrations alone, that can help, and I've seen with my own kids, uh, help them sort of process that that reality. Um, so I, 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 I think that's sort of a, the way I've been thinking about these, these two quotes that you put up there. I think I was gonna say something rather similar in that Children's literature can both make something more gentle, but not shy away from some of the really scary things that are really part of being human in the world. We, you know, uh, I think about Eno's story about, um, you know, I just felt, I felt myself getting nervous about being in the car with the backpack um, and how is this going to resolve? Um, you know, you can tell that story better than I am now very uh, making it very short here, but. You know, there's a visceral feeling. I'm, of course, not um, experiencing that directly, but I think. It could help children who pro may have been in rather scary situations in. Different contexts, but also help children who may not have had that direct experience have an opportunity to um, have some empathy and uh, maybe put themselves in the shoes of someone else for for a little while. And that 
I so admire that um, children's books authors and illustrators are not didactic about this. You know, they find a way to make it um, be authentic for the the reader. Yeah, and I mean, I you know, fables and myths and and you know stories that have been told to children throughout time have always been able to tackle issues, you know, talk about things that are scary, talk about, you know, it's actually a, a recent brief period that there was this sort of weird um, idea that children's books needed to be so completely sanitized and <laughs> done in a way that's that that preserves children's innocence in a way, you know, I'm not saying that there's not developmental you know, appropriateness at different stages and the, our goal isn't to, you know, we need to do it in a way that doesn't traumatize kids. But the reality, you know, I get a lot of criticism around my books where people are like, well, that seems, is that appropriate for kids? You know, it's like, you just think it's inappropriate because it talks about real things in the real world today and you don't want to see that. You're uncomfortable talking with your kids about these issues because you're not sure how you think about it or whatever it is that is keeping you to not want, you know, to avoiding talking about things like, you know, race or talking about, you know, you know dictatorships, um, you know, and so for me, the idea that these are are completely appropriate for kids, they always have been, and they've always been part of the way that we've, we've, you know, kids have learned how to navigate the world that we live in, which is, you know, is not the sort of this, this sort of sanitized particular demographic <laughs> of um, parenting that um, has kind of ruled children's books, I think for, but not for that long, probably just for the last few decades. <laughs> It's interesting to me, I, I, we don't have to look any farther back than probably about three hours ago when Eno was meeting with third graders and fifth graders at Marshall Elementary. And the students had, they had read the books and had been thinking about them and they had absolutely wonderful questions and, and comments for Eno. But Part of what struck me is sometimes in the spirit of kind of protecting the kids, we think that they, we, I think we do children a disservice when we assume, make an assumption that they're not already thinking about some of these things and these issues. And when I think about the third grader at the, toward the end of the session with you, Eno, who said, and I'm paraphrasing now, essentially, the child asked, um, did, were people treating other people differently because of their skin in, in Eno's experience? And that wasn't, you know, just something that that child thought about four minutes before he asked that question. A child's thinking about that and was in a position to be able to ask you to respond to that. I, that's striking to me. I love that. Um, and you know, I think for some the whole point of storytelling um, was to really help children navigate the world. You know, the world does have some, some scary things. You know, like, you can even tell a little red riding. It's like, um, but sort of the sword salt children, and sort of danger that you need unrecognized or undetectable. But just so uh, children have these things, they can navigate uh, the world. Yeah, there's a quote that I was trying to look up if I because I don't remember the name of the person who said it, and I feel like I should make sure that they are credited. Um, but um, if anybody knows it, let me know. But it's this quote about how you know fairy tales are not are not what teach 
children that dragons are real, they already know that dragons are real. What it teaches them is how to slay them. That's a wonderful quote. I'm now you've piqued my curiosity. It may be GK Chast Chesterton, but I don't yeah. know, have to look that up and put it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. The other um the other comment that one of the fifth graders not, it wasn't a comment. It was, a, you know, how when you can listen to a child, you can hear, well, we can listen to anybody, but you can hear the sincerity in the question. And one of the fifth graders just kind of looked at the camera and said, how can kids become activists? I mean, it was just that real genuine response or question. Um, and I appreciated your response, you know, as, was not to tell him not to be didactic, but rather to say, here's an, here's an array of things and some things to think about. Um, I, I think yeah, I, I grew up with uh, Khalil Gibran that your children are not your children. They're the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself and they live in a future that you will never visit, not even in your dreams. So a big part of my, whole approach to this is, um, in fact, that, you know, I am not telling them what to do. Yeah, exactly. Susanna, we have a couple of other quotes. Um, and I know there, there are a couple of them are long, but maybe if we could just take a look at the Eisner Sure, maybe I'll read it out loud too. Because that would be it is, great. It is fairly long, but I think it it's going to relate exactly to what Eno was just talking about, and that you were mentioning about the question that the child had about how can kids be activists, and Eno, you weren't going to prescribe to him uh, a set of things, but invited him to um, be aware of his own sort of journey in life and um, be open to trying different things to be to be however a, an activist he might become I thought it was really quite quite beautiful um so this quote by Elliot Eisner who uh was a professor at uh, Stanford for many years and an art educator uh in particular um and a philosopher I would say mm -hmm. um wrote this in an essay called uh, Cognition and Representation, A Way to Pursue the American Dream uh, back in 1997. Uh, decisions that policymakers and educators make about what will be accessible to children help shape the kinds of minds they will come to own. The character of their minds in turn will help shape the culture in which we all live. Decisions regarding which forms of representation will be emphasized, which will be marginalized, and which will be absent constitute decisions about the kinds of processes that will be stimulated, developed, and refined. In short, in schools, we influence the forms of cognitive competency that students will develop by providing opportunities for development to occur. In education, we are in the construction business. Thoughts, reactions to that as an educator, uh, I, I feel profound responsibility. <laughs> to uh, be very careful and thoughtful, intentional. Um, about thinking about the. Forms of representation, I emphasize, marginalize, or, um, maybe forget to include. Sometimes. I, I find the um, we are in the construction business on the one hand, maybe logically correct, but also expressing it that way felt a little 
disturbing to me because it implies that there's a final architectural plan in place. Uh -huh. Right. Mm -hmm. And really what, what we're doing is, is creating the idea that you can build whatever it is you're going to do or be or whatever. Um, but that, you know, that's an adult re reaction to that language. <laughs> and also someone who deals in higher ed with students coming in from high school in whatever backgrounds they've had. And we see it as, as our responsibility to kind of throw all that up in the air and have them think about it and reconstruct themselves. And they may end up in, in a very similar place. They may end up in a different place, but they've gone through that deconstruction phase and then reconstruction to whatever it's going to be. Um, for little ones, you know, when we think about K-12, that's a, that's a really, I mean, I think the same principle holds. We're, we're opening up possibilities, right? But we're not saying this is the one or path you need to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't necessarily, Heidi, re react to the language of construction in that way, um, because I, I think that everything that we pass through uh, in this world is a construct and has been constructed, you know, um, even how we respond to uh, the idea that um, there um, cultures and uh, the cultures that we elevate and the cultures that we sort of ignore. It's like all of that is, is sort of been constructed, whether we're not aware of it or not. Um, mm -hmm. And so this idea about what we are giving our children that allow them even uh, to think for themselves so that we're not delivering a uh, doctrine um, and sort of like canned and sort of ready to serve you know, but um, to actually um, to open them up so that they are in turn able to create something else in this world. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really interesting point, Cosby, because, you know, thinking about it from the art museum perspective, I think one of the things that historically we have forgotten about is the perceived authority that we have, or perhaps it's the real authority where we put something up on the wall and we have a label on the wall. And naturally, in some regards, because of the size of our buildings and our collections, we can't tell every story. I think some of it has been historically by design too, but I think to your point, I think it part of this is about owning that and making sure that people are aware that whether it's you know through an art museum or through a, a textbook that, that you're reading, that there are so many other angles in which these stories can be explored and thought of and interpreted. And we, we just haven't been good historically doing that, right? We put something up on a wall, we put something up in a book, and we say, well, that's it. And so that's that's the thing that you must know versus saying, no, this is one sliver uh, of what we have. And of course, the, now there is a, a large reckoning, rightly so, in our country to deal with this, right? And to make sure that we're not standing with the authority saying, no, well, what we say is gospel, right? There, in, in some regards, there are multiple gospels and some, right? Um, some maybe not, but that, I think that I think there's a really good point to that because it's about introducing something and allowing young people in this instance, right, to take it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also, my first reaction to the construction metaphor is like, well, you know, that's not how you want to think of yourself um, as, you know, so deliberately shaping as much as creating opportunities and that kind of thing. But I think the bigger picture idea that, you know, especially talking about policymakers and, you know, that this is, you know, and I'm a structuralist, so this is, you know, it does, you know, the larger structures do end up determining what you're operating options are within those structures um and i think that you know whether looking at for me i know more about children's book publishing you know the gatekeepers there are the ones who end up as in the at the end of the day centering a certain type of experience and a certain aesthetic um that you know they can 
decide to put brown and black faces on all the same stories and it's the without changing the core of the structure and it's not going to actually change a lot and so i think that the um the idea of of recognizing and owning the fact that that w within these these structures that we're operating and um, where you have to change something more fundamental than simply changing the different Lego pieces that you're working with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These make me think about um, the things that keep me up at night as a teacher educator preparing teachers to go into classrooms to work with children and how is it that pre-service teachers who are encountering so many new things and trying to learn so much in order to be able to walk into that classroom and work with children and and they're so enthusiastic and so excited and trying to help them themselves see these different possibilities to help them be able to entertain what you talked about mike as these different i i hear perspectives these different um stories the different views of the different stories and and how is it i mean that that's when I think about the construction piece, that's um, that's where it takes me to that place of teacher education and trying to think about how is it that we can do this? And it does keep me up at night. Um, I think uh, um, yeah, there's a bluff that I've been looking at right now. Over a couple of days, very slowly, I think should be required reading for most educators. And it was called uh, The Year of Miss Agnes by Kirkpatrick Hill. Um, not so well known, um, but she is a, an English person uh, that has come into rural Alaska and has taught these children in small little houses. And, and villages you know, along the coast. And these are 15 villages, and they've never been able to hold on to a teacher for more than one year because they all bring fish to lunch, and nobody likes the smell of fish. So the last teacher, you know, flew out the door, you know, both, you know, suitcases in hand, and left the cabin door open and had to be shuttled back. You know. And so here is Miss Agnes, who has worked for, for decades, you know, um, with children that was brought in to just teach them for a year until they could find another teacher. Um, and the first thing she did, she used all of the old stale books and brought in new books and brought in um, pieces of paper and exposed them to abstract art, you know, and told them, whatever you do, you know, these art person. Make it colorful. We've got to beautify this dismal classroom. And this is a one room uh, school, you know, with all of the various age levels. But she met each of them where they were, ex ex sort of where they were, and made sure that she was able to um, take them each to the next place. Um, first, also exposing them to themselves. You know, so telling the, the story about culture and showing the world map and where we're situated relative to the rest of the world. And so this idea about teaching um, has to include the students that are in front of you, you know. Um, yeah, guys, we're sort of like talking about it to the air, you know. And so every child, even the ones that had disciplinary problems that were not interested in school, whose main uh, focus is to spend time thinking, they were now so engaged, um, engaged even by hurting out loud, you know, to, you know, the, and, and that included the listening, listening to the older 
students, you know. Um, so that's why when you said Dan about Jenny about the um, books for seventh and eighth graders, nothing should be off the table. I agree with you a hundred thousand million percent, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, do we have a, a time for a question about the creative process? Absolutely. In okay. Fact, I think you've read my mind. Thanks, honey. <laughs> um, you know, I'm both of you, <laughs> you know, and Cosby are are author illustrators, right? And you know, we know that there are other versions of this. There are people that are just illustrators and people that are just authors. What is the creative process for each of you? When you are conceiving of the book, are you thinking of the images first, the words first, or everything at the same time? Go ahead. Go ahead, Cosby. Patty. <laughs> I'm sorry, I froze for a second there. You want me to go first? <laughs> okay. Um, I I start with for children's books. I start with a story. Um, the you know the rest of my work, most of my life, I'm a graphic designer. I do gra illustration art, and I'm and usually the story is provided to me, and then I'm focusing on or the narrative is provided for me, and I'm focusing on how to tell that with image. But when I'm starting a children's book, I just focus on writing and telling that story, um, and then I go back. And I figure, you know, and the illustration part is a lot easier for me because I already, I can always find a way to illustrate something. It's more like how to tell it, distill down the story to something that, that, um, that hits the mark is what I, what takes me the most time. To you know, um, I would say for me, I know for me, mama, it was inspiration was, uh, my daughter had uh, broken my favorite top. It's so well shaped, and I'm trying to get everything out of it. She was just going to give me a cup of water and do something nice for me that day, and crash kaboom on the ceramic tile, and that was the end of that. Um, and so that um, really, and I wound up seeing those broken pieces because I thought, thought even in that condition, it was still something beautiful to behold, and I had the urge to paint it. Um, and that's when I started to just collect all, all of those strange moments in the course of our everyday. Um, that actually, it, it seems as if nothing's happening. You know, it's like watching. Um, it's like watching the sheet, the sheets dry <laughs> um, clothes on. Um, in fact, the soul being watered and nourished. And fed, and something really critical is occurring in that sort of like everyday moment. And I just wanted to to, to capture that. Um, but I typically do work with the store first. Um, when I'm just illustrating, I I won't do a complete read of the manuscript because I find that there's a power in that first reading um, that I don't get if I've spoiled it by sort of reading ahead too much and um and those first impressions um that I, I draw on they I lose um it, the material too familiar. Um so I generally do a very quick read um I, I think the language I, I make this yes or no um and then I, I put it aside for a moment until I'm actually ready to to work on it. Um, but there's something about the story that propels, um, you know, to necessarily the other way around. With the, the images, I find um, can be dispensable because there's so many constantly asking myself the question: What's the best way to show this? What's the best way to tell this? And I try not to be too attached to what my precious little hands have done. That those were both really quite, you know, somewhat different, somewhat similar kinds of answers to that question. 
That, that was very interesting. And I wonder when I think about the language that's used, and we talked about earlier about how Cosby's is very multi-sensory, and yours, you know, it's very rhythmic, you know? And I, I wondered whether the, there is a, a speaking aloud of it as you're writing or whether it just comes out that way. Yeah, I definitely have to read it aloud. Um, you know, a lot of the, like I, I have sort of a, a beat in my head when I'm writing mm. and then it's really interesting to hear other people read what I write. And then, I, and I, I do a lot of field testing. This is a thing that I think I do that isn't um, so common is I, I do always send my books out at different stages from very early on. I first read it with my kid and then I read it with the kids in our community. And then I send out um, rough drafts of it to people and I'll often listen, you know, if it's a, for little kid books, I'll have, I'll listen to the parents reading it to their kids. And I realize, you know, my beat's not the same as everybody else's and people will stumble on things that, that I seem feel is obvious. Um, and so I do a lot, and, and for me, the most important thing is that it works with kids first and foremost, right? And so I, I do send it out to families with kids in the right age ra age range with a with a um, I, I give them sort of a survey a set of questions about it that I say ask these to your kids um, I want to hear what their answers is I don't want your opinion I do I'm going to get their opinion whether they you know I want it or not so I'll hear what the parents have to say but uh, I do go through quite a bit of trying to make sure that it works not just in terms of how it works in my head but that it should work um, for other people and it doesn't work for everybody obviously I know I'll hear people you know and they complain about something you know when i try to do something that's a little bit um not simple a b a b on something but um that's okay you know they'll figure it out eventually but uh, so there's some judgment that has to go into how much rhythm um or how much of an obvious rhythm there needs to be in in something but uh, but definitely you know for storytelling for for these books at this level that you know i put as much if not more time into finding the flow in the in the story um as i would any sort of you know illustrative piece of it the visual part of it mm -hmm. interesting <laughs> i would say that i'm perhaps a complete um opposite and this action and, and that I loved behind closed door um, in the closet um, and and come out you know um, it, because I find like I work in process it's like it's something I got all myself um, and and then share you know um, and and, um, and usually if it worked you know, from my instincts um, then it, it's a man's say um, at least that's been my experience um, so yeah so i will um I, I guess my writing voice maybe closely mirrors my um my speaking or thinking um voice and they're all sort of one voice um and um yeah and so yeah i guess that's how it is with me I, I tend to do it all privately and then and then present and you know, I'm coming from the perspective um, that there, there's so much that we maybe pigeonholed into what children um, will expect, accept, and um, uh, in, in the way that I think, like, like the version where you know it's like they're presenting something um, entirely and children are able to respond to it. Um, you know, so our notions, for example, that you know, um, we should do the nursery in either primary colors or pastels, you know, as opposed to bringing in the Moroccan rug or, you know, other items all over the world. I think that children respond to anything that we, um, anything that we care to share with them and, um, and they go with it, you know, they're able to go with it, you know, and so that's how you can get, for example, carpenter, hand to three-year-old toddler, you know, hand carving tools and not be afraid, you know, that he's going to bludgeon himself, you know. It's like children really pick up and sense things really early 
uh, it's just a matter of you know, what we're exposing them to. And my thought is it doesn't have to look exactly like everything else. Yeah, it's very much about what the adults, you know, define as, you know, the in the children's book world, it's this whole, you know, the gatekeepers, you know, it's the, when you see you know, starting with the agents through the editors, through the publishers, to the distributors, to the, you know, it's like at each level, there's a particular demographic of people who have a particular idea about what a good children's book is. And, you know, all that has nothing to do with what children's will children actually like it has to do with sort of this this aesthetic around children's books and Benjamin you probably see a lot of of this surveying children's books out there but there's a certain way that it you know it's, it's sort of predetermined it goes back to that structural question indeed indeed i i uh, truly understand and and reflect what you what you're saying um, that is very much the case And Ben, I was even thinking of the um, story you told earlier earlier about a leaky. Maybe you could share that story with with this group. I think they'll understand it in a way that will resonate. Sure. sure. We had um, back in well, currently we have an exhibit on book dummies, and one is uh, that that a leaky. A uh, book that she did back in 1984, and the book was finished. Uh, it was of an Asian family, and the publisher contacted her on the day it was to go to print and said, "We've changed our mind. We want the family to be white. We feel that it will sell better." And that was given to her in a written format, uh, and so she then had to go and and. Reillustrate the entire book in a sense, because in 84, um, digital format and digital opportunities were not like they are today. And um, it, it's just, you know, I, I think back to the 60s, to 84, and to today, we, we've we come a long way. We still have a long way to go. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see the history and the things that have happened in the world of uh, illustration um, in my time uh, in being involved. I'm conscious of our time and everybody's time. Um, maybe before we kind of finish for today, um, if anyone has any kind of final comments about what you've heard or telling us what next steps ought to be in terms of continuing this conversation, because I think we have literally just kind of touched the surface um, today. And um, I know that more as more people have an opportunity to uh, view our recordings of, of these sessions, um, more will come, <laughs> more will come. So that's my concluding comment. Anybody else? Yeah, so something that, that strikes me about this conversation is how much respect all of our panelists have for children and what children are able to process and how they're able to connect and there there really aren't subject matters that are too tough to handle right i mean as long as you present them in the right way and i just think that as adults it's so easy to dismiss kids right and it's just that this this group here and particularly our our two author illustrators just have so much respect for experiences and recognizing that children have experiences just like adults do. And, you know, and, and, and trying to connect with them in a way that's not overcomplicated and <laughs> or or demeaning. And so that that that's always a for me, that's that, that can never repeat be repeated enough. So, so thank you to you all and, and to everybody else on the panel.
I guess I'll, yeah, I mean, jumping off of that, I feel like, I mean, that's sort of the core of it. With this particular audience, I feel like in particular, I don't really, the problem doesn't usually come from educators, people who actually work with a broad range of children on a, on, you know, at different levels, particularly if they work with, you know, diverse groups of children and different classes of children, you know, like people are, you know, who are working in places that are, that actually represent the, you know, that are not sort of some sheltered private school in some rich neighborhood tend to actually have much less of a like of a problem with trying to, to with understanding why we would want to talk about with children about difficult issues and that the children can actually handle talking about difficult issues and if you're not talking to them about difficult issues then they're talking with each other about difficult issues and the television is talking to them about difficult issues and you know the stories that you're get, that they're getting and the narratives that they're developing um around these you know may not always be accurate but they're going to develop some sort of understanding of it one way or another and people who work with children you know understand that and so they're always happy to have you know books and other tools that allow you know to open those conversations with children the usually the kind of the the, the kind of the, the stumbling blocks i find are were really more about a particular demographic of parents who are um who struggle with whether or not you know i think their own discomfort around talking about issues and whether or not you know they have this sort of mythical children's you know innocence thing that they're trying to maintain and that's you know that's where i'm not sure where <laughs> where the intervention <laughs> can <laughs> best happen Absolutely. and i i agree um and it, you know and talking about what it means um to respect children um to understand that they are in fact children that they have um, newly arrived <laughs> and they are sorting through things, observing things, um, preparing and contrasting to say, it's not this, it's that. Um, they're connecting their dots. They're just engaged um, and plugged in in so many different ways. Um, and all of the learning that occurs in their one day, it's not even visible to our naked eye. And so, in addition to the hard stuff, there has to be a steady douse and dose of joy because they are, in fact, children. <laughs> and that would hold true of children all over this world. That makes me think of, um, I think, Jenny, this is one of your favorite quotes. And so I'm going to let you get it correct. But I think it's Ralph Fletcher. Just. Uh the notion that um, we want children to have a chance to marinate in language. And I think we could also say marinate in uh, visuals that um, spark their curiosity and their imaginations um, and also their critical questioning of, you know, who they are in the world. They're wanting to figure that out from day one, right? You know, <laughs> and they're indefatigable about it. <laughs> um, but do you remember the exact quote? No. I don't right now, but, but, but I think the, the critical word there is the marinating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, and I, I think that's, that's what always strikes me about that is, you know, much like I feel like I've been able to do today in terms of marinating in children's literature, um, some slices of children's literature that, believe me, I don't get every day. <laughs> I, I would just like to say thank you for the two of you for doing what you do. <laughs> it enriches all of us. And, you know, oh. where we're able to share it with others, uh, it's, it's a real gift and um, I think a tool for improving the world. I, thank you. Thank you very much, Heidi. One of the things that Heidi didn't mention and I didn't say, but it's 
a really important piece. Heidi and and Mike have been really helping the University of Toledo um, across colleges think about the importance of visual literacy and how is it that that enriches all of our lives and helps us raise these kinds of, of critical questions. Um, so we are we are indebted to her and to Mike too for um, helping us, helping us all, teaching us all. We need that. We need that. Well, I think it's probably about time for us to wrap. I, I think it might be. We should say <laughs> some thank yous. Most of them. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> some thank yous. Um, to to Ben, thank you so much for um, bringing a bit of Maza to us. We appreciate that um, and look forward to the day when we can actually visit the museum um, and and really have an opportunity to look through all of your wonderful exhibits. Um, we really do thank you and appreciate that very much. Um, to to Mike. Thank you, Mike. We are so glad that you brought your perspective from the art museum. Um, uh, Cosby, um, you and, and you know, you may not know this, but the city of Toledo is so, so fortunate to have a world class art museum. And um, we are so fortunate at UT to have Mike and and the folks um, that he works with at the museum work so closely with us. So, Mike, thank you for joining us today um, and bringing the perspective of the museum, but also of the father of Munchkins. You know that was really helpful. <laughs> uh, so, thank you to that for to to you for that, Heidi. Thank you for everything. Obviously, for the continued work that you do. Um, Eno and Cosby, I can't even begin. Yes, we should be clapping. <laughs> um, I can't begin to thank thank you both for joining us, not just this afternoon, but this morning. Um, and we really appreciate all your efforts and all the kind of the the tests that we did before to make sure things would work. So we appreciate that. And you uh, will be. Um, Oh, one thing I should say for everybody is that this morning we invited the kindergartners and the second graders at Old Orchard Elementary and the third graders and the fifth graders at Marshall STEM Academy to try their hand at telling a story that's important to them. And we invited them to write their story, illustrate their story, and um, I'm going to be in contact with their teachers so that we can pass those stories along so that you have an opportunity to see um, what our authors and illustrators are doing, our young authors and illustrators are doing. So that will be coming as well. Um, look for some correspondence from me for all of you. I appreciate your time. And there are other people too, Susanna, whom we probably should thank. There, there are, of course, <laughs> all kinds of people. Our Dean, um, Dean Raymond Woody, who was on this call, but we've got him muted and <laughs> we um, can't, un I can't unmute him. Um, so at this point, um, Thank you, Dean Whitty. We appreciate your support. Oh, wait a minute. He's unmuted. I Dean. am. Oh, oh. well. I've, I've taken this all day. I have not had a chance to speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, this has been wonderful. I, I can't thank everyone enough for the um, sensitivity, awareness, understanding, education, uh, collaboration, and all the other words that uh, I can't think of at the moment, but um, truly, this has been wonderful. And the college thanks you for for your um, participation. 
and hopefully we can continue uh, doing this kind of work. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be interest in doing that. So thank you again. Thank you, Dean Whitty. Susanna, perhaps you would like to thank the next person on our list, Mrs. Judith Herb. Right, so uh, Judith Herb, the namesake of our uh, college at the at the college of the Judith Herb College of Education um, has uh, kindly helped sponsor the the giving of about 400 books of uh, Eno and um, Cosby to local area schools, um, public schools, school libraries, and uh, of course to all the children who participated this morning. And that's a little bit part of uh, the Steam Power Generation project that I'm leading at the moment with um, uh, I'm the, the endowed chair at the moment for the steam power generation. And I just thought this was a wonderful opportunity to dovetail the importance of, um, you know, steam, of course, mostly stands for science, technology, engineering, mathematics, but the arts are extraordinarily important uh, and uh, the driver of so much in that's good in the world. So, um, I wanted that project to be sponsoring this. So we thank Judy very much for her support, continued support. And we could not have done any of this today were it not for um, two invaluable colleagues of ours, um, Taylor Yarborough and Josh Spielis. Um, Thank Maybe you. They show themselves for a moment. They deserve yes. a major round of applause. Absolutely, <laughs> they do. Yay. Uh, and poor Josh had his second COVID vaccine yesterday, and so he's powered through today. So thank you, Josh, for all of that. Um, and and obviously we thank them this morning, but we will do that again. Um, the principals and the children and the teachers at both Old Orchard Elementary and uh, the Marshall STEM Academy, um, we really appreciate their rearranging their schedules to to be able to join us. And quite honestly, they were so thrilled to uh, to be able to have an opportunity to talk with with Cosby and with, you know, we really appreciate that. So who have I forgotten, Susanna? I think you've gotten everybody um, just many, many, many thanks. I am. I'm, I'm really quite sad now to <laughs> <laughs> to say goodbye to everybody. To goodbye. I know, I know, I know, but I think we probably should do that. Um, so thank you everyone. Have a wonderful, well, you know, you at least have some more of your day <laughs> <laughs> being in California. I got to go take my kid to his climbing team now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Take care. Yeah. All right. Thank you.